20 miles off the Welsh coast, a Dutch frigate just rehearsed a problem that keeps every modern navy awake at night, the moment the sky stops being airspace and turns into a crowded, hostile marketplace of cheap machines. HNLM's Evertson, an air defense ship built for high-end threats, spent three days in exercise sharpshooter tracking and neutralizing a mix of targets designed to mimic a swarm attack. Five aerial drones were engaged, two unmanned surface craft were sunk. On paper, it reads like a clean training scorecard. In reality, it's a window into how NATO navies are trying to adapt to a battlefield where quantity can be as lethal as quality. Because drone swarm is not just a buzzword anymore, it is a tactical philosophy. Overwhelm the defender's sensors, decision cycles, and magazines by forcing them to deal with too many contacts at once, from too many directions, at too many altitudes, while something more valuable slips through. And the uncomfortable part is that the attacker doesn't need exquisite technology to make it work. They need coordination, persistence, and enough disposable platforms to keep the defender reacting. If you can make a warship spend a multi-million dollar interceptor on a target that costs less than a family car, you are already winning a kind of economic contest. So the real question is not whether navies can shoot drones, it's whether they can do it repeatedly, under pressure for days without burning through their readiness and their budgets. That is exactly why sharpshooters' design matters. Chinetic's pitch is a blend of live and synthetic threats. Live targets like Banshee, Whirlwind aerial drones, and Hammerhead unmanned surface vehicles give crews the visceral realism that simulators can't fully replicate. The clutter, the speed, the imperfect tracks, the timing friction between detection and engagement. But then the exercise layers in virtual threats, representing cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and hostile aircraft, because you can't safely fire a real ballistic missile at a training range, and you can't afford to fly the perfect storm of threats every week. Synthetic injects let planners scale complexity to the point where the crew's systems, procedures, and command decisions get stressed in ways that feel uncomfortably close to real combat. And that's the key, stress. Anyone can look competent in a short scripted event. The moment you extend it to multiple days, fatigue becomes a factor. Maintenance becomes a factor. The crew's internal rhythm starts to degrade. That's when the little mistakes happen. The delayed report, the misprioritized track, the moment when a radar operator hesitates because the screen is too busy. Commander Marcel Caveling's comment that the crew stayed in a higher state of readiness for multiple days is not a nice to have. It's the whole point. Swarms are designed to keep you on the edge until your edge dulls. So what did Evertsen actually practice? Not just shooting drones. It practiced the full defensive loop. Detect, classify, decide, engage, assess, while new contacts keep appearing. A swarm attack is a test of triage. Which track is a decoy? Which is a scout? Which is the real weapon? Which one threatens the asset you're protecting right now, not in five minutes? If a drone is slow and noisy, do you spend a missile? Or do you save that magazine depth for something faster and deadlier? If an unmanned surface craft is closing, is it carrying explosives, acting as a sensor, or simply forcing you to reveal your tactics? Every answer has a cost, and a good attacker is trying to make you pay the highest cost at the worst moment. The mix of aerial and surface targets also reflects a broader trend. Threats are becoming layered, not neatly separated into air and sea. Unmanned surface vehicles can be used as distractions, as explosive boats, as reconnaissance pickets, or as nodes in a wider network. Pair them with aerial drones, and you create a multi-axis problem. Your radar picture becomes crowded, your electro-optical systems get saturated, your communications become more intense, and the most dangerous part is not the drone you see, it's the one you don't see because you were busy dealing with six others. This is where high-end air defense frigates like Evertsen are supposed to shine. They carry the sensors and combat systems designed to manage dense air pictures and coordinate engagements. But the Swarm era challenges even the best ships with a simple, brutal truth. You can't intercept everything with expensive missiles forever. That pushes navies toward a layered approach where missiles are reserved for high-end threats while cheaper effectors, guns, close-in systems, electronic warfare, decoys, and directed energy in the future handle the bulk of small drones. Yet integration is hard. It's not enough to have the tools. You need the doctrine that tells you when to use which tool, and you need the training that makes those decisions automatic under pressure. Sharpshooter is also an interoperability story, and that's not a public relations flourish. If NATO expects to fight as a coalition, then coalition defense must be practiced in peacetime. The sea does not care about national boundaries. Threats do not come with a convenient flag. In a real crisis around the North Sea, the Atlantic approaches, or a carrier strike group deployment, ships from different nations will share sensor data, deconflict engagements, and coordinate their defensive fires. That only works if the crews trust the shared picture and understand each other's tactics. Will Blamey's emphasis on allied readiness is basically an admission that the future fight is not my ship versus your threat. It's a combined network trying to survive a combined attack. 
Notice the institutional detail here. Sharpshooter is run by Chinetic, with threat scenarios designed by Inspire, a Chinetic-owned company, and tied into broader UK test and training infrastructure across multiple sites. That points to something bigger than a single exercise. Western militaries are outsourcing parts of training innovation to defense industry partners who can iterate quickly, blend live ranges with synthetic environments, and collect the data needed to refine tactics. In the swarm context, data is power. Every engagement produces lessons about detection ranges, identification errors, reaction times, and the real consumption rates of ammunition and missiles. If you want to know whether your warship can survive 10 minutes of saturation, you don't guess, you measure. And there's a strategic implication hiding in the background. This is not just about drones. The exercise includes virtual cruise missiles, ballistic missiles, and hostile aircraft. That suggests planners are thinking about the stacked threat, where cheap drones arrive first to force you into revealing your radar modes, burning your interceptors, and exhausting your crew, and then more sophisticated weapons follow. The attacker's dream is to make your most advanced ship behave like a stressed, ammo-conscious platform, second-guessing every engagement because the next wave might be worse. The defender's job is to keep discipline, maintain magazine depth, and preserve the ability to defeat the truly lethal threats when they appear. So when you hear Dutch warship downs drone swarm, don't picture a simple shooting gallery. Picture a rehearsal for a future in which swarming systems are a permanent background noise of naval warfare, cheap, persistent, and adaptable. The Dutch frigate's success is encouraging, but the real victory is the learning cycle. Crews under sustained pressure, confronting mixed domain targets while synthetic injects push them toward the complexity of a real fight. Because the next war at sea will not be polite, it will not be linear. It will be a contest of attention, endurance, and decision speed, where the side that manages its sensors, its people, and its magazines better is the side that gets to keep sailing. And that leaves us with the uncomfortable final question, if a training event can generate this much pressure in controlled waters off Britain, what happens when the same problem arrives in a contested zone with jamming, deception, and real consequences? That is why exercises like sharp shooter matter, and why every Navy watching this trend is quietly asking the same thing, are we training for yesterday's threats, or are we building the reflexes for tomorrow's swarm? If you want more analysis like this, focused on how technology reshapes doctrine and how doctrine reshapes outcomes, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.